Welcome to episode 190 of The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. In today's episode, I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. John List to discuss his new book, The Voltage Effect. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to The Brainy Business Podcast, where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. Today, I am very excited to introduce you to Dr. John List, former chief economist at Uber, current chief economist at Lyft, professor at the University of Chicago, co-author of the wildly popular book, The Y-Axis, Hidden Motives and the Undiscovered Economics of Everyday Life, who is here talking about his newest book, which just came out a couple days ago, titled The Voltage Effect, How to Make Good Ideas Great and Great Ideas Scale. There are, of course, links for you to get The Voltage Effect in the Y-axis, as well as other related books, find related episodes and links and connect with John, all within the show notes for the episode, which are waiting for you within the app you're listening to or at thebrainybusiness.com slash 190. Those already on the Brainy Business list got a direct link from me in the email you receive every Friday. Not on the list yet? Simply sign up for any freebie at thebrainybusiness.com and you'll be automatically added. The freebie for this episode is the first chapter of my award-winning book, What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You. And if you already have the book, in which case, thank you, you'll also be automatically added to the list when you get your copy of the free PDF companion workbook. Both are housed in our free behavioral economics community called the Be Thoughtful Revolution. There's a link to join that global community in those show notes as well. All right, let's jump right in. Dr. John List, welcome to the Brainy Business Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So, so, so excited to talk about your new book, The Voltage Effect. And there will be plenty of time for examples and and things as we go. But uh, just to get started, can you tell everyone a little bit about you and your background in behavioral economics and anything else that you want to talk about? (laughs) Sure, sure. So my background is I'm a truck driver's son. And I was really never meant to go to college. The only real reason why I went to college is because I wanted to become a professional golfer. And I was given a partial golf scholarship at a school called University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. Now, about two months into that scholarship, it was a very hard lesson, but I realized that I was never going to be good enough to make any money as a golfer. And I talk about this in chapter nine on on, uh, the winners quit. So I, I quit on that dream. I didn't quit on the team. I, I continued and played golf all four years and, and fulfilled the scholarship. But I, I went to my new dream, which was um, economics. And as an undergrad and graduate student, what I did with economics was I went to the field and I went to these baseball card conventions as a baseball card dealer. and at these conventions, this would have been the late 80s and early 90s, I would buy, sell, and trade baseball cards. And at those conventions, I would test economic theory using these small-scale experiments on bargaining, auctions, price discrimination, etc. And in many cases, what I would find is that neoclassical theory isn't perfect in that it needs a tweak here and there, nip and tuck, if you will. And that's what really gave rise to my interest in both using the world as my lab, which is what I call doing field experiments in the world, and also learning about the world through the lens of behavioral economics. I love that. So I'm curious when you were doing, when you're working as a baseball dealer or, or baseball card dealer, uh, were, you, <laughs> were you already studying economics? And so you were intentionally testing some of those theories or you were sort of naturally doing it and then discovered that 
economics is what you were interested in? Yeah, that's a great question. So at the very beginning, it would have been the end of my high school days. I graduated in 1987. I was naturally doing it, but until I started to take economics courses, I was not literally saying, well, wait a second. What I learned at that show was that this really isn't quite right. So after I learned, I would take the lessons in many cases from the classroom and I would go to the market and I would explore whether those learnings were correct or not. And a lot of times I would bring those back into the classroom. And I think sometimes I was a really good student that way, (laughs) but other times I was a very rotten student because a lot of times when you're teaching the theory, you just want to teach without disruption. I've taught for 25 years now. (laughs) The type of student who I was, I think Early on in my teaching career, I would not want in my classroom. But now that I have a lot more experience, I would want someone like me because it brings in real world experience and it really livens the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And as we found, as behavioral economics has grown a lot, (laughs) almost all of it since 1987, like you're saying, then traditional economics needed some questioning to be coming in, as we've seen, that not everything worked in the real world. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. The way that I think about it is I I live in Chicago, and if I want to go to a baseball game at Fenway Park, neoclassical economics will get me to roughly the parking lot of (laughs) Fenway Park from Chicago. But to actually get nestled into my seat, the correct seat, I really need behavioral economics on top of neoclassical economics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Love that. (laughs) Good. We were talking baseball even, you know, before, as I had said, my, my husband also loves baseball. He has now. Have you made it to all the stadiums? Nearly everyone, but not quite all of them. Yeah, I actually am not a big baseball fan myself. However, I've been to... 16 stadiums all with my husband as he was finishing up. So he's, he's done them all. But then like, even as we were on the last trip, he said, well, you know, I haven't been to all the spring training stadiums. (laughs) (laughs) There's always something that comes up next. (laughs) Same thing with baseball cards. I have all the rookie cards, but I don't have that second year card. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, There's that, whether it's scarcity, FOMO, whatever, right. Lots of things we can work in there. So uh, then as we talk about this book and the voltage effect, I feel like should start, it doesn't all start with Uber, but you were already doing stuff with scaling. um, And I guess we should note, you know, the subtext here on the book being it's how to make good ideas great and great ideas scale. And scaling is so, so important. And as you have uh, lots of experience in this, what what got you interested in scaling? No, that's a good question. So let me give you a moment that induced me or shoved me to do work in this area. And then that moment opened up a lot of reflection. So the moment was really after I started a pre-K program, a a pre-kindergarten program here in Chicago for three, four, and five-year-olds. I I developed it with some colleagues from the ground up. The idea was, can we build a pre-K program that will not only help children, but we can scale it so the whole world will use that curriculum. So I worked really hard from, say, 2008 to 2014 to build and run this pre-K program here in Chicago. Roughly 5,000 kids came through. So a really big field experiment. And after the results came in, I was super proud. I not only wanted to write academic journal articles, I wanted every policymaker in the world and every expert in the world to use my curriculum. This is when the slap in the face came. (laughs) Across the board, 
policymakers would say that will never scale. And I said, why? And she would say, doesn't have the silver bullet. I said, well, wait a second here. Where, where's this silver bullet? Where do I find one? How do I buy it? And, and what does that actually mean? And it comes down to, they then say, well, we really don't know. But typically what happens is the promises that the researcher gives us about the program are never met when we scale. So to me, that represented two kinds of challenges. First of all, is that statement true? And lo and behold, I spent years and years scouring, and it is true. And it's what I call the voltage effect in this book. The voltage effect is turning a mountain into a molehill. So I found this mountain in my pre-K program, a great result in the Petri dish. But then when we scaled it, it turned into a molehill. That almost could be a new economic law. You know, in economics, we have law of demand, law of supply, law of comparative advantage. You could literally have the voltage effect law. Okay, that's, that's point number one. Now, point number two is then I started to reflect. And I started to think, where else in my career has this sort of popped up? And I went all the way back to the early 90s and thought, you know what? Those results that I was finding in my field experiments at baseball card shows, do they horizontally scale? You know, you find them in one market. Do they scale to other markets? Do they generalize? That's a very important question. You see, back then, when I started doing field experiments, and for the 30 years since, the profession has thought about using field experiments to figure out what works and why, you know, what are the mechanisms behind what works. But we very rarely say, are we doing something that is scalable? And what do we need to do differently in our original research to make sure if we find the program works? Will it scale? So then I started thinking about my time in the White House. I worked at the Council of Economic Advisors from 2002 to 2003. And I thought about policies like Energy Star. And I, I developed legislation, I helped write legislation called the Clear Skies Act back then. Constantly in our minds was scaling. And then came kind of the touch moment. It was in 2016. I was sitting at Market Street in San Francisco with my wife, Dana Suskin, and we were talking about scaling. And this was through the lens of, at the time, I was a chief economist at Uber. And I was talking about some of the ideas and whether they would, should scale or not. And my wife looked at me and said, you know what, your entire career has been spent on pushing field experiments and figuring out whether behavioral economics works in the field or whether it doesn't. She said, maybe the back half of your career should be thinking more deeply about scaling. And I looked at her and said, you know what? It feels like the stars are aligning because I'm going through this issue with Czech, with the Chicago Heights Early Childhood Center, which is what I was pushing our new curriculum. I've, I've reflected on the White House, on my previous work, and now what's going on at Uber. And a constant thread in all of those walks of life is you can only make big change at scale. So I said, let's step back and really learn about the science of using science. And that's what the book is about. I love it. That's like you said, the hindsight looking back and going, hey, I have been working on this for a really, really long time and that you have some examples to go from and um, sort of spoiler alert, right? You figured it out at least. <laughs> and not- <laughs> I hope I figured it out. It's a very difficult problem. Let's put it this way. I think I've made a step in the right direction mm-hmm. of trying to understand 
what should we look for in ideas to figure out if they have elements of a voltage drop or if they have elements of high voltage at scale? I think I've made a step in that direction. I think that's true. I don't like to oversell because people always yell at me for overselling. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to oversell my book. I will. I will. <laughs> we, we, we got it. So with that, uh, what are some examples? I know that there are kind of like a big five from the, the book and, you know, the voltage effect in general. So what does that look like? And, you know, what are some things to think about as people are considering scaling? That's the heart of the book. So that's a great question. The way that I have now come to think about the problem is that the experts and policymakers who told me that your idea does not have the silver bullet, they were thinking about the whole problem wrong, or in in a way, exactly backwards. Because the scaling problem is more like an Anna Karenina problem. So I'm sure your listeners are quite brilliant and intelligent, and they have probably heard about Anna Karenina. And what I think is probably the greatest opening line, at, for sure in Tolstoy's books, but maybe ever, when he said, happy families are all alike, each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Except for the name and a few other changes, Scaling is the same thing. Scalable ideas are all alike. Each unscalable idea is unscalable in its own way. But I have figured out through all of this research that there really are five important vital signs that any idea has to have to have a chance to scale. So now here's a spoiler alert. Let me quickly give you those five, and then we'll sort of unpack them. So when I want the listeners to, let's say, take away from these five is that I have not found an idea that has failed to scale that will not fall in one of these five vital signs. And every idea that I know that has scaled in a big way has actually had or checked each of these boxes of the five vital signs. Now, before we get into them, I also want to caution that just because your idea does not check all five boxes, that doesn't mean you should still go for it. There are a lot of ideas that might check three boxes and it's still worth your time and and money and, and our public dollars effort. My only point is, we should try to understand before we sink a lot of resources into ideas, what is the capacity or the, the maximum efficient scale of our idea, okay? I, I, I talk about in the book, my, my grandpa and my, my dad and my brother, they're all truck drivers, and their business model is one man, one truck, one good living. They, they realized that they're the secret sauce behind scaling and they can only drive one truck at a time. So then that's, that's their business, which is wonderful. It's great business. They live a very comfortably up in Wisconsin. Okay. So let's unpack the five vital signs. Vital sign number one, I want your listeners to think about this as a false positive or the idea never had any voltage to begin with. So this can happen for two purposes, for for, let's say two reasons. One, it's just statistical error. Whenever we do science, there's always an error component in that science. And it tends to be 5% of the time, what we say will work really won't work. And that's called a false positive. The other kind of false positive is more nefarious. This is, I want you to think about uh, Theranos or the social scientist or the hard scientist who literally fabricates data. That's what I call a duper in the book. The first vital sign is make sure 
that your idea actually has voltage before you try to scale it. And there are a lot of failed attempts at scaling that fall prey to this false positive effect. And in the book, I talk about one of the most famous ones, I think, is um, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No. I was a child, of, I was a high schooler in the 80s. And I can still remember, like it was yesterday when officials came in and told us, just say no to drugs. And I looked at my teacher and I said, I don't use drugs, but I have a lot of friends who do. And this information campaign is never going to work. <laughs> and and the, the teacher said, well, hold on a second here, John. You might be right, but they, they do have data behind this. They actually did. It, it was a pretty large scale study in Honolulu. The problem is, is there's only one study and it never was replicated and it was never the truth. So it was just bad luck. And Nancy Reagan spent a lot of her years as first lady essentially selling a false positive, something that just didn't work. So that's, um, that's vital sign number one. Vital sign number two in the book, I call it Know Your Audience. So this idea is basically when we do a first study, a lot of times we do it with a convenience sample. We do it with a sample that they might be very eager to take up treatment. They might be a low cost sample because we just want to do an efficacy test. And unlike in, in medicine, in the social sciences, a lot of times after this efficacy test, we publish it, but we forget to tell people it was an efficacy test. We're in medicine, they have phase one, phase two, phase three. In the social sciences, we have published in an academic journal, everyone thinks it's the truth, and then move on to the next problem. Policymaker will adopt it sometimes, and then many times it will only work for a sliver of the population. Now, I, I saw this in spades at Uber. So at Uber, I had a really bad experience one time. I, I was taking an Uber to a convention and I was supposed to be giving a keynote talk at that convention here in Chicago. So I'm, uh, I'm getting ready to get in the Uber and the Uber comes up. I look at my watch. I'm, a, I'm about a, you know, 20 minutes from the convention center and my talk doesn't start for 30 minutes. So it's going to be perfect. I jump in the back of the Uber, driver takes me driving down to Chicago. As usual, I'm working on my slides last minute because this <laughs> is just how I operate. I, I can't do things early. So I'm working on my slides. I look up, I see the buildings and look at my watch. Think, this is going to be perfect. I'm going to walk in with a great slide deck right on time. So I go back to work. About 10 minutes later, I look up. I'm back in front of my house. And, and I look, I'm like, wait, what's going on here? The driver said, well, the app blinked. And I look back and you were so content and, and into your slides. I didn't want to bother you. I figured you forgot something at home. So I brought you back home. And I said, no, <laughs> take me back. So I ran in, gave my talk. But that night when I got home, I went out to my garage and my wife knows when I go to my garage, it means that somebody's going to be in trouble. <laughs> I called Travis Kalanick and TK picks up and I say, Travis, we have a problem. And I told him what had happened. And I told him in no uncertain terms that I'm never going to use his blankety blank <laughs> app again. And I have just become a Lyft loyalist. His own <laughs> chief economist is going to proclaim that he's a Lyft loyalist. <laughs> and TK said, look, John, sorry. And I said, Travis, that's the big problem is I never received an apology from Uber. And he said, just haven't gotten around to it yet. And I said, TK, we have now. So my group at Uber, which is called Ubernomics, we developed a new product called Uber Apologies. And we tested it and rolled it out. And what we find is it works brilliantly. Right after a bad trip, 
which bad trips cost Uber millions of dollars a week in bad trip. Anytime you have a bad trip, a lot of times people just say, to heck with Uber, I'm never going to take it again. So the scientists and the market people at Uber saw these great results and they wanted to roll it out to everyone immediately. So we did. But lo and behold, after you do that, what you find is apologies really only work for new users. They don't work for users who have been around a long time. So that's a policy that you have to know your audience because when you send it to the users who aren't new, it's literally just a money giveaway because it has no treatment effect. But our, our biggest treatment was we give you $5 for ride credit. That was the one that worked. And if you use it for people where it's not working, it's essentially just a money giveaway. But if you focus it on new users, the audience where it works for, you get voltage. And then for the audience where it doesn't work, you have to develop something new. And that, that's not an apologies product. It's something different. And now that apology that they're using at Uber Eats, Uber, and we use it at Lyft now. For your listeners, I'm now the chief economist at Lyft. So I, I switched sides. Okay. So, so that's been number two is basically know your own audience. And in the book, my, my running example is loyalty programs. It's uh, a lot of firms now are using loyalty programs to lock in users. There lo- there's lots of interesting behavioral economics around loyalty programs, but um, there really is less known about what is the best construction of a loyalty program and what, what's the best behavioral economics behind it. So that's what kind of that chapter gets into. So that's the second bin of the, uh, of the vital sign. The third bin is around, instead of around people, which vital sign number two is around, it's around the situation. Is the situation at scale the same situation that you had in the Petri dish? And this chapter is titled, Is it the Chef or the Ingredients? Because when you look at restaurants, for example, the ones that really work when scaling, it's because of the ingredients. And that's because humans don't scale. So if you're a chef, you can't be at a zillion different locations at one time. And the fact that humans don't scale makes it very unlikely that if the secret sauce was the chef, that your restaurant will be able to scale. And, you know, coming back to the Chicago Heights Early Childhood Center, you know, if an important ingredient in check was the set of teachers that we hired, it's one thing to hire 30 great teachers. It's altogether something different to hire 30,000 great teachers. So if that's a non-negotiable in your idea and you can't replicate it at scale, it just won't scale. So that chapter goes through a bunch of examples like that, like understand your situation. Now, here is the moment when you start to say, well, what can the researcher do in the initial steps to make sure that their discovery can scale? You know, a lot of times we banter about evidence-based policy, and that's like the big mantra of everything. Even in firms, you see evidence-based decision-making. I actually want to change that around entirely, what, let's say 180, and, and start the researcher and the business decision maker around the notion of policy-based evidence. And what I mean by that is look at all of the constraints at scale, look at all of the flaws, and then bring that back to the original research and say, with those constraints in place, Do we have an idea that can still work? So for example, in Czech, we're going to have to hire a lot of really bad teachers. So put a lot of really bad teachers in the classroom in your experiment and explore. Does it still have voltage? If it does, great. And that's how we can change around the thinking about research is, you know, a lot of times we generalize across populations of people and situations where we only typically talk about representativeness of the sample. 
like we say, are there enough men and women, old and young, black and white and brown, et cetera, et cetera. That's great stuff. That's vital sign number two. But very rarely do we sample different kinds of situations. And that's what we need to do more of in the business world and in the policy world. That's vital sign number three. The vital sign number four is what I call the spillover effect. And here, I, I think Uber is a good example here. So do you remember the lead Uber campaign in 2017? Mm. Oh, um Yes. I, and, I, and when I was reading in the book, like, oh, right, right. I remember. Exactly. So yeah. January of 2017, Uber had Lyft knocked out, basically. Uh, Uber was dominating every market. And then something bad happened. The end of January, President Trump puts out an executive order. A bunch of taxi cab drivers strike in New York. And Uber made a misstep. Uber made a decision that people felt was trying to break the taxi cab strike. And all of a sudden, that Saturday night, a delete Uber tweet goes out. And literally, it became viral, went viral. All of a sudden, Lyft had new life. And I, I was at Uber then. and. At Uber, we were running around trying to figure out how can we bring back drivers and riders after this to lead Uber campaign. My argument was we need to add tipping on the platform. At that point, we didn't have any, any tipping opportunity through the app. So my team fought. And uh, a few around the company joined me, and we ended up winning. We convinced Travis to put tipping on the platform that summer, the summer of 2017. And my team was responsible for rolling it out and doing the experiments around the introduction of tipping. Now, you can imagine a great experiments, like behavioral experiments, like nudges with the um, you know, should you do zero, one, and two dollar tips? Or right. Should you do, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was all fun. What what we were interested in primarily right away is, you know, all of the drivers wanted tipping because they all thought they were going to make more money if we added tipping. So we did it with a small group to start, five, say five percent of drivers, and we find that tipping does increase their pay. If they get paid more, they work more. You know, that's that's called uh, in economics, the labor supply elasticity. It was about 0.4. So then we rolled it out across the entire market. What happened here was very instructive because when everyone gets the tipping app, then everyone works a little bit more. They completely undid the good stuff of tipping, raising wages, because now there were more drivers driving. And the consumers, the demand curve didn't go up enough for it to not entirely erase the increase in wages from the tips. And now more drivers were working, but they were just driving around emptier more often. So in the end, they earned about the same amount of money with tipping. That's called a spillover. And what happened was the good stuff of trying to raise their wage through the tipping was a good thing in the petri dish but if you allow it across the whole market and the market comes to a new equilibrium it can undo all of the good stuff so in that case what vital sign number four is is really try to understand what are all the spillovers whether it's through the market or from you know treatment to control group or control group to treatment group that might affect you at scale okay now, number five is a, a simple one. And so far, I've been talking about all of the voltage effect on the benefit side. You know, when we scale, there might be a benefit drop. Vital sign number five is really on the supply side. You should really understand whether your idea has economies of scale or diseconomies of scale. And what I mean by that is if it has economies of scale, as you grow bigger and bigger, the cost to provide the good 
actually goes down. And think about Amazon.com or Walmart or, or Tesla or, or anything that's made it big, it has great economies of scale. Now, on the other side, there are some ideas that have diseconomies of scale. And what that means is, as you grow bigger and bigger, it becomes costlier and costlier to provide the good. So think about Check, my early childhood program in Chicago. If I want to maintain teacher quality at a really high level, and I want to hire 30,000 teachers, what do I need to do? I need to continue to raise wages to attract those great people to be teachers. That's called, in economics, going up the supply curve. So what's going to happen now, even though the benefits stay the same, there's going to be a voltage drop because of the supply side. It's going to cost so much that I just can't provide the program in a cost-effective way. Okay, so that's, those are the five vital signs. And that's really the first half of the book that we've just literally gone through. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I thank you for walking through them. It's helpful having those tips for people and knowing, of course, yes, that's the first half of the book. And like, there's so much more detail in how to be spotting these and how you discovered it and the research that you did. So everyone, not that they would be fooled, but definitely still worth, of course, uh, getting your copy of The Voltage Effect. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) And I was definitely, I talk a lot about the importance of context and that things aren't typically generalizable, especially not in the way that people like to think that they would be. So just because you read about this great study where something worked with nurses in New Zealand, it doesn't mean they're going to, it's going to work for lawyers in Texas, right? So you have to, some of what you're talking about here of making sure you understand. But one of the points I love that you make in the book that you say, like most people don't do this is to test kind of the thing that could knock you down, like to get to the other side, uh, test against your hypothesis. When Matt Confer was on, we talked about doing the pre-mortem, right? So thinking about what could go wrong and then (laughs) doing something about it. No, I think that's exactly right. So so your first point is, is spot on. The context or the properties of the situation are super important. And that's, that's where I think that vital sign number three encompasses. Now, you're 100% right that think about what are the potential non-negotiables in your idea and poke at them. And that's a hard part because we always want to give our idea its best chance. Now, If you really want to do that, that's fine. Do that as step one. But as step two, poke and prod and figure out where are the weaknesses, what are the non-negotiables. And if those aren't available at scale, now you have to change your idea and refine. And great businesses have always done this. You You can come up with a list of companies that are brilliant now, but started out as dating apps or started out as uh, deliverers of alcohol to 50-year-olds or whatever that have pivoted to something really great. And they've been able to do that because the entrepreneur pokes and prods and is willing to say, look, I'm not going to suffer from confirmation bias and just look at all the good stuff and, and ignore the warts. What I'm going to do is figure out where are the warts, what are the warts, and what can I do about them if they cause me to fail at scale? And it just should behoove all of us to do that because you know all of us want to move fast and break things when it comes to scaling. That's a great mantra. And I've, I've worked with a lot of fast runners, but I've never worked with a fast runner who gets to the finish line when they're running the wrong way. And that happens nearly every time when you're not thoughtful from the beginning. Yeah, that's a, a, a different way of saying where I'll, tell, I'll say to people, it's really easy to find the right answer to the wrong question. Exactly. So if you, yeah, if you don't know what you're working on, what problem you're solving, like you said here, who who's it's 
before knowing the audience and making sure you're testing enough, uh, you know, you're just not going to get there. So uh, I think though the hardest lesson for a lot of people in this is to start pulling at the sweater <laughs> and, and see where it's going to unravel so you can fix it before somebody else does. No, you're a hundred percent right. Or before it fixes you and drives you to uh, bankruptcy. But look, anytime we look in the mirror, whenever we see a look that we don't like, we, we quickly do a different angle and say, well, that one was lying to me. I, I'm actually a lot better looking than that. <laughs> you know, I have a problem all the time. I'm, this is John List, who's a, an old gray haired man who's kind of overweight. Like that, that wasn't the right picture. It was actually this one. That's the wrong way to think about ideas and how we're going to spend our time. You, you want to look extra at those glances that don't look as great and, and put your confirmation bias and correspondence bias and everything, every other bias we have to, you know, say that we're beautiful to the test. Otherwise, look, we have a finite number of days we get to live on this earth. We only have so many ways to change it and change it for the better. Why not give yourself the best shot? Why continually dupe yourself and go down a rabbit hole? That, that's short run pride and might make you happy in the short run. But in the long run, you're not going to be very happy when you keep coming up empty. It makes no sense. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, so I could, of course, keep talking with you about it for, you know, five, six, seven more days, not just hours, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, you know, for, for your own time and want to be considerate of that, uh, want to make sure we wrap up the show. So if you have any last thoughts on, you know, the voltage effect in general, as people are looking to go and apply it in addition to getting the book. So we'll say, you know, then also to share what's the best way for people to, to get in contact, to learn more, to get their copy of the voltage effect. No, no, absolutely. I think that what we learn in the voltage effect is, is one part for businesses and entrepreneurs, one part for policymakers, but also one part for truck drivers and, and people who want to learn not only about what ideas might work, but also kind of what's the proper course to live. And when I think about the, the second half of the book is basically how to run a business, an organization, or a person's life. How to make decisions that once you have your idea about what you want to do with your life, how to maintain high voltage. So I hope that that's the way people think about this. It's, it's kind of the second half of the book is using storytelling and standard ways to think economically to make better decisions in your life. Things like, we're always told not to quit. I think that's exactly backwards. People don't quit enough. We're also told things like, when you're making decisions, you know, think about the holistic view, when many times we should be thinking about on the margin. If I go right or left, what are gonna be my outcomes? What's the opportunity cost? of going left. It's missing out on right and a wealth of other things. When you start to think about an economics 101 student, you end up opening up a whole new level of decision making that will in many cases involve taking on behavioral biases, learning about behavioral biases, but in the end, you, you lead a much better life. So that's what I hope people can take from the voltage effect. Now, where you can get it, it's at all the usual places. Uh, go to Amazon.com. Um, just type in the Voltage Effect, John List. You'll see uh, our own website. And um, if you have any questions at all about the Voltage Effect, shoot me an email. Uh, my email is jlist at uchicago.edu. If you want to talk through your own decision making with your organization, my group works with a lot of organizations. We're, we're glad to to brainstorm with you as well. Fantastic. We will definitely have links to all the things in the show notes, except I never put people's actual email addresses written out in the show notes because of your own spam requirements, right? I don't need to spam my guests. So for everyone who's <laughs> listening, you know that you can, you know, 
rewind 10 seconds, write that down so you can have it, but it won't be listed in the show notes. So that is a way that... Uh... <laughs> Excellent. They, they get rewarded for listening. I like that. Melina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep. So, uh, well, thank you so much again for joining me on the show and everyone definitely pick up your copy of the voltage effect links in the show notes, go to Amazon, wherever, and, uh, you are going to love learning about the voltage effect and how it applies to you in your life and business. Thank you for having me. Thank you again to Dr. John list for joining me on the show today. What got your brain buzzing in today's conversation? I think this idea of ideas that scale is such an important one. And as we touched on in today's conversation, it doesn't need to be at the size of Uber or Lyft. Educational programs need to be able to scale. And many businesses face the hurdle of scaling at some point. Until now, this likely felt like an unknowable commodity, that there couldn't really be a theme or thread between ideas of disparate businesses, and there couldn't be rules that were applied to make it more likely that an idea will scale or how to know when it won't. In The Voltage Effect, John gives insights into these rules so you can vet your own ideas as you're growing to determine if they'll scale and are worth investing time in and what to do for those that might not be ready to scale yet. Remember, the subhead of the book is making good ideas great and great ideas scale. So there's a path for you to follow within the pages of this great book. And as a reminder, there's a link for you to get your own copy of John's brand new book, The Voltage Effect, as well as his earlier book, The Y-Axis. You can also find related past episodes and other important links and related books within the show notes, which are waiting for you at thebrainybusiness.com slash 190. Now, what was your favorite insight from the show? Give John a shout out on Twitter. He's econ for everyone. That's E-C-O-N underscore the number four underscore everyone. It's linked for you in the show notes so you can check it out easy, but econ for everyone. And I'm the brainy biz to start a conversation about your favorite insights. Those handles are, like I said, linked for you in the show notes as well at the brainy business.com slash one nine zero. I'm sure that he would love to hear from you. I know I would, and we can talk about great scaling economics awesomeness. And if you enjoy the experience I've provided here for you, will you share about it? That could mean leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen, sharing this episode or any other with a friend who you think would find value in the insights, or even hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already. Thank you so much in advance. I appreciate it and you. Thank you again to Dr. John List for joining me on the show today to discuss the voltage effect. It was a delight to chat with and learn from you. Next week, Dr. Rachel Laws is here to talk about using semiotics in retail. It's going to be a lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. Until then, thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.